Good to see you all again. Now that you've been able to take a few minutes to unsoil yourself after Mr. O'Fallon's presentation. Like when we got asked in the panel yesterday, why are you guys doing this? Oh yeah, you know. In fact, I was over here just a second ago and just saw the headline from Fortune Magazine two days ago when we started this conference, the headline at a Fortune Magazine. 50 new stocks to invest in as the new world order sets in. We ain't kidding, folks. So what I want to talk to you today about, actually, the hard part is over. You don't believe me, do you? <laughs> we're going to be a little easier today, actually, with what I'm presenting, um, largely because we're going to be a little bit closer to the present instead of having to read stuff that was written in the middle of the 1800s which had a slightly different style, and they're only going to read a little bit from Marx. Uh, I want to talk today about actually things that latch into what Michael just talked about. And I will tell you, I did not know what Michael was going to talk about uh, before he did it. But it ties into what Michael said, and I think it's going to put a lot of um, foundation under what he said from the perspective that I bring, which is just reading their literature my magic power, by the way, is reading their literature and believing them. People ask me all the time, how do you do what you do? I just read them and I believe what they say. I don't think that they're, you know, doing some other thing. They're just telling you what they think. And so the technical title here is The Role of Consciousness in the Evolution of the Gospel of Marxism. And that's where we're going to arrive but I want to build a couple bridges to what Mr. O'Fallon talked about. So I was rushing these kinds of things in while uh, he was speaking. I want to build a little bit of a bridge that ties together what we've been talking about with what Mike just spoke about, that also bridges the gap from 1840 up to today. And then we're going to go, as Mike was pointing at, and build the bridge that lets us see what's coming tomorrow. But we'll start by building a bridge to Mike. So he mentioned the priest, Dom Helder Kamara, and he mentioned his odd ties, and he pointed out the tie to his young acolyte at the time, Klaus Schwab, and he pointed out his ties to his acolyte at the time and the person that has become Pope Francis. And he mentioned, but neglected to add that third piece for me, his tie to Paulo Ferreri. And we're going to talk a lot about Paulo Ferreri today because he's really the one who's developed the modern side of the consciousness of Marxism that's necessary to do what is being accomplished by these people today. So Freire wrote a book in 1985 called The Politics of Education, and I'll just point out, I'm only bringing that up, I'm going to read from it quite a bit, but I'm just pointing that out for the moment because Dom Helder Kamara's name appears in that book. He criticizes the fact that other people outside of their movement are calling people demons and enemies and he says one such enemy that's maligned by the press is one Dom Helder Kamara. Names him explicitly. So there's a profound influence on Freire. And in this weird book on education, which it is a very strange book on education, and if you want to hear how strange it is, I'm reading most of it as a series of podcasts on my site, New Discourses, newdiscourses.com. <laughs> there you go, Stuart. There's all this stuff in the book that's not about education at all. It's about religion. It's a very weirdly religious book, given that it is the book that in 1985 was positively reviewed by the Harvard Educational Review and then led to Paulo Ferreri's ideas taking over education in the United States. It has an entire chapter dedicated specifically to liberation theology in the church in a book that transformed secular education in the United States contra the Establishment Clause by colonizing every college of education. And in that chapter, he's talking about a phenomenon that he says he's comparing different kinds of churches. He gives three different kinds of churches, two of which, of course, are wrong, one of which is his. The three types of churches are the traditional church, conservative, bad, the modernizing church, pretending to be progressive, but as a matter of fact, just reproducing the old thing in a new package. Bad. 
And then he calls for what he calls the prophetic church. And the prophetic church is the one that has to go forward. This led his acolyte by the name of Henry Giroux to say that what Paulo Freire achieved, and he says this in the introduction to the book, is a permanent prophetic vision for education. Giroux really is an educator, a Marxist educator. So these things bleed together. That third leg of the stool Mike was talking about, public-private partnership. So you've got the public, you've got the private, You've got the faith, you've got the Father, you've got the Son, you've got the Holy Spirit working together in a trinity that is becoming a new world. Exactly what I've been saying, what Mike's been saying throughout this whole conference. And Freire says, on the prophetic church, in contrast with the churches considered above, that's your traditional and modernizing churches, the prophetic church rejects all static forms of thought. It accepts becoming in order to be. Because it thinks critically, meaning critical theory, meaning Marxism, this prophetic church cannot think of itself as neutral, nor does it try to hide its choice. Therefore, it does not separate worldliness from transcendence or salvation from liberation. It's exactly what Mike just said with the Augustinian construct. I know what finally counts is not the I am or the I know or I free myself or I save myself, nor even the I teach you, or I save you, but the we are, we know, we save ourselves. He goes on a couple paragraphs later to say, in the same way, no church can be really prophetic if it remains in the haven of the masses or the agent of modernization and conservation. The prophetic church is no home for the oppressed, alienating them further by empty denunciation. On the contrary, it invites them to a new exodus. That's bold. Is he setting himself up like Moses over here? Nor is the prophetic church one that chooses modernization and thereby does no more than stagnate. Christ was no conservative. This is an education book, by the way. The prophetic church, like him, must move forward constantly, forever dying and forever being reborn. Not once, over and over and over again, forever. In order to be, it must always be in a state of becoming, that's in italics. The prophetic church must also accept an an existence that is in dramatic tension between past and future, staying and going speaking the word and keeping silent, being and not being. That was Hegel. The synthesis between being and not being is becoming. It's in the same paragraph. He says there is no prophecy without this risk. So we've built a bridge to everything Mike just said, not just in terms of the ideas of what role the church plays, how it ties and bleeds into education, everything we've talked about in this conference so far in addition, but also literally to the people that were identified as the movers and the shakers that made it go this way. Since we're building a bridge, let's do a quick review of how we got here so we can then talk about where we're going. We started the other day by talking about the dialectical faith of leftism. What was that? That was the idea of Rousseau's leftism, a social contract being our governing thing, where we give up through a negative process some of our freedom to attain more freedom. This will lead us to bring man back to his true nature while keeping the benefits of the cities. We're going to make savages who inhabit cities through a term that in German became Aufheben, the dialectical process. Hegel was inspired by this and mixes in his hermetic alchemy, the dialectical trinity. The idea gives rise to the state and the position of the sun. The sun gives rise to the spirit of the society, which when it realizes the dialectical contradictions, stimulates a revolution that moves the dialectic to another turn through history. The trajectory of history is toward the awakening of the absolute at the end of history, at the omega point, at the eschaton. Clearly a theology. Marx picks these pieces up, Rousseau, Hegel, mixes in Feuerbach's materialism, which was cast in Hegelian terms, and he 
comes up with this idea that we have to cast out the mystifications of Hegel, even the mystifications of Rousseau, and we have to look at this in a new way. We're going to stand Hegel on his head. We're going to turn this upside down. No longer is there going to be God at the top of the Trinity, but man at its bottom. Man is becoming his own God. And this is the dialectical faith of leftism. This is the theology of Marxism. Marx brought in Gnostic alchemy to Hegel's plain old alchemy with a little bit of Gnosticism in it with Rousseau's Gnostic leftism. The goal is that man is God in the making. Man is God who doesn't know he's God but is becoming that. Becoming aware of that and then consciously seizing the means of production of society and man to make himself that which he already is but does not know. Just like the hermetic view of Hegel was that God doesn't know that he's truly God until he works it out. Through people setting free the shards of the Prisca Theologia, the ancient theology, the unifying one true theology which Marx identified as socialism in the form of perfect transcendence of private property which he called communism, true communism, not crude communism. So you have socialist man made to inhabit socialist society. But as Mike reminded us, this is the dialectical process. Although Hegel referred to it as abstract, negative, concrete, it goes back to Kant with thesis, antithesis, synthesis. So the goal now is to make synthetic man who inhabits synthetic society. And every time it's been tried, tens of millions of people have died, but it'll work this time. Because the real thing hasn't been tried yet. Because synthetic man hasn't been interjected with the proper new sensibility to make it work. So we have to change everything. We have to use faith. We have to use education. We have to impute a new consciousness into man so that the very level of his biological needs, tells us Herbert Marcuse in the 1960s, are changed so that he cannot live without socialism. So this is the faith of dialectical leftism. And dialectical leftism isn't true. But the article of faith is that if you believe it and you do the work, theory and practice, it becomes true. That's reflexivity. The concept Mike has been talking to you about through all of his lectures. Paulo Freire says that the theory can't merely be reflective in the sense of Hegel's looking into a mirror and reflecting upon things, it also must be reflexive. He says that in the politics of education. We know that dialectical leftism moves dialectically. Theologies modify themselves within the context of the theology. Its theology is that the dialectic is how history and things change. So it moves dialectically. This is an inherently negative process. We're going to give up some of our freedom to have more freedom. That's Rousseau's leftist social contract. In other words, through a process of negation. So Hegel sees it as abstract, negative, concrete. This is like going to society, imagining it like a tree, and believing that if you chop it down, and when it starts to grow again, you chop it down again. And when it starts to grow again, you chop it down again. And when it starts to grow again, you chop it down again, that eventually you get the tree of life. Whatever you have, cut it down, disrupt, dismantle, and eventually it will work. Because what you're actually chopping down is the mundane form that the divine has trapped itself within and must be freed from. The failures of our ideas are merely their mundane form, and when we break them open through the deaths of millions, the true spirit is released and will eventually recollect into a perfect society with a perfect man in a perfect state that doesn't even need to exist and relinquishes its own power. This is alchemy. Free the shards of the divine from their mortal coils and they will collect together and immunitize. We know that the dialectical faith of leftism doesn't just move dialectically by this chop it down, chop it down, chop it down. Now it's good process. Now it's whole, actually, holistic. We saw that word in Mike's presentation. It's to be a holistic move. Guess where that word comes from? If you guessed these same characters, Hegel, Marx, correct. But you don't just move dialectically, you move left. 
every single step. And I had the wonderful, I guess we're in a church, we'll call it providential conversation last night. Pastor Kyle, (laughs) who pointed out that there's a graphic he saw that I don't have, so I can't show it to you, but it's that we always see the thing move left because after you do the dialectic, he told me, he saw this graphic, what you get isn't a new center, you get the new right that you now have to move dialectically away from again. And the thing you get on the next revolution is the new right wing that you then have to move dialectically away from again. So it doesn't just spiral to a point of history, it spirals leftward to the end point of history at perfect leftism. This is actually what Freire says. After the revolution, that which became, becomes a new society immediately becomes old. The demand of critical consciousness is to create the revolutionary conditions. And the second the revolution is realized, he says, you have to have more critical consciousness to do it again. He says this explicitly, repeatedly throughout the politics of education. We'll read from Freire a little bit on this. He says, because men are historical beings. Now, you, thought, you wouldn't have thought a dang thing about that phrase before this weekend, would you? Because men are historical beings, that is, creators of history. Creators. This is Marxism. Because men are historical beings, incomplete and conscious of being incomplete. What did I tell you makes man yesterday? Revolution is as natural and permanent as a human dimension as is education. So that's the point of education, is to teach people to have a revolution. And your children are a perfect reflection of that. Only mechanistic mentality holds that education can cease at a certain point or that revolution can be halted when it attains power. To be authentic, revolution must be a continuous event. Otherwise, it will cease to be revolution and will become sclerotic bureaucracy, which in that same section, seemingly indicting Stalin, he says, makes it actually a feature of the right. The new cultural reality itself, Freire writes, is continuously subject to negation in favor of the increasing affirmation of man. Not the worship of God or the glorification of God, the the affirmation of man. You have to affirm my gender identity. That word pops up a lot. In cultural revolution, he says, however, this negation occurs simultaneously with the birth of the new culture in the womb of the old. Why? Because, to quote, it is precisely this creation of a new reality, prefigured in the revolutionary criticism of the old one, that cannot exhaust the conscientization process, a process as permanent as any real revolution, as transforming beings. People may stay glued to the new reality that comes about from their action, but they will be submerged in a new unclear vision, conscientization which occurs as a process at any given moment, should continue whenever and wherever the transformed reality assumes a new face. You get your revolution, you do it again. Because otherwise it became old. It always goes left. The second the revolution, the most crazy left-wing revolution you can imagine, is complete, and you establish the new left-wing, more perfect government, our democracy, It's already right wing. It's already old. It's already static, sclerotic, sclerotic, bureaucratic, conservative. And you have to move left again. It always moves left, and it always moves dialectically left through the process of chopping down what is, disrupt and dismantle, such that The perfect ideal society, in the words of Herbert Marcuse, can be released because it is contained in the existing society, which is just corrupted in its outward forms. This is the dialectical faith of leftism. This is how we got here. So even dialectical leftism has to reinvent itself. Otherwise, it becomes old. Marxism is old. That's why Dom Helder Camara says he doesn't think of himself as a Marxist. He criticizes the Marxists. The critical theorists criticize the Marxists. That's the neo-Marxists or critical Marxists. The cultural Marxists criticize the Marxists. They can't be Marxists. The postmodernists criticize the Marxists. They can't be Marxists. They criticize Marx. The woke criticize Marx. They can't possibly be 
Marxists. But Marxism has moved dialectically leftward, stage after stage after stage, because the moment it came into being, it was already old, and a revolution in its own thought had to be achieved. Ironically, that means Marx was wrong and Hegel was right. The idea has to be refined immediately. And so we can think of this as a computer, if you want, with an operating system. I've said that many times. We've talked about the operating system of the left. This is the operating system of the left computer. The dialectical left that's been dominant since the 1880s at least, but has been with us since whether you want to count it as 1807 with the phenomenology of spirit, 1762 with the social contract from Rousseau, 1831 when the young Hegelians caught into their stride, 1844 and 1848 when Marx started writing his things. I don't care which date you pick. It's been coming into existence and evolving dialectically leftward ever since with large amounts of dominance by the 1880s, total dominance over education by 1990, which you will check your watch and shock was 32 years ago. But if you have an operating system, it doesn't have to run the same program. You have the system. Rousseau ran some kind of social contract program in there. Hegel ran some kind of weird idealist program in there. Marx ran some economic materialist program in there. The cultural Marxist reframed what it means to have economic standing in terms of high culture and low culture and ran a kind of bougie culture, if you want, program. The critical Marxists ran a program on pop culture. The identity Marxists who came out of Marcuse's revolution in the late 60s ran identity culture. When we get to Freire and the postmodernists, we're talking about ideas like language and knowledge are the thing that they're running. The woke movement operates in that space. The software it's currently running is language and knowledge. Same program, same underlying operating system, shouldn't say same program, same underlying operating system, different software program that it's running, runs it in the same way. So this gives us what I called, and you gotta let me seriously cheat here. This, I wanted a week, so it sounded good. Like left it, like, like in the Bible, right? God created the world in seven days, so I want the dialectical week, the seven days of the dialectical week. But the joke that I wanted to tell you, so I've ruined it by calling it that, was that unlike the seventh day God rested, communists never rest, so there is no day off. Solzhenitsyn said in the Gulag Archipelago, I know you're tired, but you don't know what these people are capable of. I assure you the communists ruining your society is not tired. I get it. I'm with you. You shouldn't have to fight this crap. And you don't get to choose what time you live in. So with Rousseau, we have what I will refer to as day zero, because I have to cheat to get to seven. <laughs> but he wasn't really doing dialectical leftism anyway. He introduced leftism. He kind of had some dialectical ideas, but we haven't got to the real thing yet. We're going to call day one Hegel, because that's where the actual dialectical trinity in its form was laid out, as Marx and Engels told us. Its first real step toward a usable form came from Hegel. So that's day one. We've already talked about that a lot. Marx becomes day two of dialectical leftism, the first week of this faith. That's real dialectical leftism. We just discussed that. Day three, I'm going to give two pictures, unfortunately, so we're cheating again. Day 3A, and I'm not going to talk much about this, but Michael mentioned it, and the reflexive concept is, is, is completely tied into this. The Fabian Socialists came into being in 1844, or 1884, sorry. Not coincidentally 100 years before 1984. George Orwell was not a fan, by the way, of the Fabians. But also, day 3B, if you will, or later that afternoon, Vladimir Lenin creates Marxism-Leninism. It's a different track. So you have the Fabians have this infiltration, wolf in sheep's closing thing. Lenin's not that. He's like, I'm a wolf. Damn it, let's go. <laughs> and what, van what he brings into it is called the vanguard model. That the stupid proletariat isn't going to awaken. The stupid working class doesn't have what it takes to become a revolutionary movement. So some of the members of the elite bourgeoisie have to form a vanguard party that will lead them through, a council, a Soviet. And his Bolshevik movement became the vanguard that forced the socialism on the people under the belief that if they live it, it will interject the values that will make it work 
in the end, millions die. Doesn't work. Kind of a bad day. Day four. Some guys in the 1910s and 1920s, as this is playing out, kind of looking around, and they're like, huh, this isn't going the way we thought it would. Marx said that the workers would spontaneously unite. They didn't spontaneously unite. Something's wrong. Marx said that industrial centers would go socialist, while the dialectic of history would move agrarian and peasant economies into capitalism first, that then would later go socialism. But we have no industrial centers, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, London, Paris, Berlin, none of them are going into socialism, but backwards peasant Russia did because of the Bolsheviks. Something in the theory is wrong. So they said there must be a cultural force that's causing it. And the dialectic moved out of the ideal from Hegel, out of the material from Marx, and into the cultural realm. Somewhere culture is the relevant thing. So cultural Marxism arises. It has kind of two points. One is actually borrowing off of the infiltration model, and that's the Antonio Gramsci that Michael mentioned, who's, uh, who was translated into English for the first time by Joseph Buttigieg, who's Peter's father at Notre Dame in 1970. That's where the concept of the long march to the institutions comes from, which in 1972, you can read in Herbert Marcuse's neo-Marxist work, very explicitly became his plan after the direct revolution at the end of the 60s didn't work infiltrate the institutions, become the thing. Become a programmer who programs, but you're a Marxist. Become a biologist who does biology, but you're a Marxist. Blah, 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 blah. That's the virus model that we talked about from the paper right here from Arizona State yesterday. Become the virus through the radicalization in the educational institutions. Learn to do the thing, but bring your new religion with you to the new institution that you infect as a virus. That's literally the thesis of the paper. So that was born, actually, in the 1920s, and then because Antonio Gramsci was imprisoned, it didn't come to light until the 1970s, with one possible exception. It's not clear that Mao knew what Gramsci wrote. It's possible, but there's no evidence that he did, but the saying in the literature is that Mao did what Gramsci thought. So there was this blip in 1966, right about when it would have been surfacing also, but in Italian, not in English, or maybe, I don't know, Chinese. Mao was already putting into practice the cultural revolution of Antonio Gramsci in China to great success. That's day four. Maoism is the kind of fruit, that's the Leninist version, in fact, of the cultural Marxist idea. Day five, however, in the West, critical Marxism is born. Critical Marxism is usually called critical theory, but Isaac Gotsman in a book called The Critical Turn in Education begins by saying that that's a mistake. We should call it critical Marxism to identify what it really is. These guys can't help but tell on themselves a lot because the critical theory claims to criticize Marx and Marxism. So how could it be a form of Marxism? By the way, I, I should have mentioned with cultural Marxism, did you know that doesn't exist, right? If you have a chance, you shouldn't have your phone on, but if you do, you should look and see. Go to the Wikipedia entry for cultural Marxism and see what it says. It's not there anymore. About two years ago, they took it down and replaced it with cultural Marxism conspiracy theory. <laughs> Kid you not. Critical theory was not Marxism until Isaac Gotsman in 2016 tattled on him and said the right name for it would be critical Marxism. So I'm trying to retrain myself to call it that, and it's surprisingly difficult. The goal there is to redefine the very terms and resurrect utopia. They were informed by a very influential cultural Marxist who Mike didn't talk about much by the name of George Lukács, a Hungarian. George Lukács laid out a theory of consciousness to overcome the cultural milieu that people were in, to overcome that cultural hegemony that kept them from becoming Marxists. He said, you don't just have to give people the agitations of Marx, you have to conscientize them. You have to make them have class consciousness. It's a process. He wrote this in a book in 23 called History and Class Consciousness. The critical Marxists obsessed about how to overcome 
false consciousness with, with what they called critical consciousness, which is no longer just class, but the entire operation of society has to be brought into criticism. This is because the guy who named critical theory thus began in essence critical Marxism, Max Horkheimer said that he conceived of the critical theory specifically. He conceived of the critical theory specifically because we can't describe a good society in the terms of the existing society. We have to question the very terms of the existing society. Kind of tangential and sideways to this because the French and Germans are not always friends. A postmodern Marxist movement arose in France out of linguistic theories that were ultimately derived not just from Marxist thought, which they were, but also from another lineage of Rousseauian thought. Rousseau gave rise to Romanticism. Romanticism gave rise to French existentialism, which is full of despair and nihilism and destruction. Existentialism bled through into what was called structuralism, which is a weird study of how language conditions your reality. And the postmodernists are also known as post-structuralists, who took it a step further by mixing in much more despair and a bit more Marxism in the rejection of Marxism because, of course, it's a dialectical process. And then sometime in between then and now, actually, I should, should linger on the postmodernists because Mike talked about Baudrillard and the strawberry. Let me linger there. You have three major, there's a lot of major postmodernists. I don't want to oversimplify, but we're going to talk about, I'm going to mention three. Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault, and uh, Jean Baudrillard, which that's the strawberry guy, except he didn't talk about strawberries. He's a matrix guy, except he said that the matrix got him wrong because it's actually critical theory posing as his philosophy, as it turns out. Jacques Derrida was the true post-structuralist. He said that the structure of language itself reproduces the forms of power, so we have to rethink the structure of language itself. So he's creating a very dis and despairing Marxist theory of how language conditions how we think. And that has to be rethought so that we can have a Marxist theory of meaning making at its very basis. What words mean, how words relate to one another. And we're going to see for Freire that words become very important. Foucault billed himself as a historian, which is ridiculous. He wrote very purposed, complaining critical historiographies is what they're called about madness, about sexuality, about the way that the governing bodies and powers have changed through time to continue to restrict dissidents like himself, homosexuals, weirdos, pedophiles, to restrict their, as he said, potentialities of being, which is an extraordinarily Marxist phrase, his limited subjectivity imposed upon him by the power, and he wrote histories of how power changed dialectically throughout time, and how, in his despair, this is largely hopeless, but in his lectures in 1979 on what he called biopower and biopolitics, he concludes that the authority of science is the new regime of truth. And then, of course, we have Baudrillard, who's pointing out that we will live in a realm of images and propaganda, and that it can become so thorough and saturated that we no longer have access to reality whatsoever, and we're stuck in a simulation of reality, where everything is a simulacrum of what it once was, with no attachment back to the real object that it represents. So we, ob we occupy a desert of the real, a synthetic reality, and the goal is to make a synthetic man that inhabits a synthetic reality. I think the word for the first real attempt for this is metaverse. But that was in the 70s, bleeding into the 80s. Speaking of that, actually, let me talk about the 90s in Baudrillard. He wrote a book that I've been referring to a lot. I bothered to read it. It's amazing what happens when you bother to read books. He wrote a book in the 90s called, be prepared for shock and awe, The Gulf War Did Not Take Place. The Gulf War did not take place. He says it wasn't a war at all. It was an atrocity masquerading as a war. That which people call the Gulf War was mostly a production by politicians and CNN. Real events happened, real bombs went off, real people were killed, real things occurred, but the entire war was on false pretenses, did not happen as played out, and it was a television production. Images, fake. 
and we had our first fake war. And so then, when a certain public health crisis happened, one of the first things I thought was, and I don't think I can say that directly, but get creative, YouTube. <laughs> COVID-19 did not take place. The conflict in Ukraine did not take place. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm saying what Baudrillard said, that we were presented an image of these things that is not the reality. It is a hyper-real, as he called it, projection of what really occurred, which cannot be neutral. It has to have a political purpose. That's his criticism. So then we arrive into the 90s. We're all in the identity Marxism out of Marcuse's revolution that came out of the last part of the critical Marxist movement. But we've had Freire now impact education. We've had the postmodernists impact feminism. The post-structuralists were almost ignored by everybody except feminists who wanted to destroy the gender binary and, we'll say creatively, imported their ideas in a, I wouldn't even call it a dialectical form. I would say they just didn't know what they read and made something up to purpose. But that had become dominant in feminist thought and feminist thought had tremendous sway over the academy in the 80s and the 90s. And so postmodern ideas crept in and this new idea that there's going to be a Marxist theory of knowledge, one from the critical side from Freire, one from the postmodern side through the post-structuralist feminists, there's going to be a Marxist theory of knowledge and knowing. The whole system, how we consider what's true and false, has to be reevaluated because it needs to be subjected to a Marxist analysis that shows why we have false consciousness and need true consciousness to be, ar uh, to be arisen. We have to die to the old world and be reborn in religious language. That requires conscientization, so says Freire, riffing off of the cultural Marxist George Lukács. George Lukács, by the way, just as long as we're mentioning this seven-day week that we've now covered, woke as day seven. They did not rest on the seventh day, for they are communists, and they do not rest. See, I still delivered the joke. <laughs> now that we've covered the seven days, um, I want to draw one more couple, or I guess a couple more threads through these guys. Um, George Lukács in the 20s, actually before the 20s, in 1918, was instrumental in the Soviet Revolution in Hungary. He was appointed as Deputy Commissar of Education for the short-lived Bela Kun uh, Hungarian Soviet regime. It lasted four months because it turned out the people were not happy with some of George Lukács' more radical ideas for how to make sure that you can transform a society. In particular, George Lukács was particularly interested in sexualizing the children because he knew it would destabilize them, it would separate them from their families, it would separate them from their culture, it would separate them from their nation, and it would separate them from their religions. And then you can give them a new one, a new family and a state, a new culture and communism, a new lack of nations in the Soviet sprawling uh, block and a new religion in communism, the theology of Marxism. Herbert Marcuse, who I mentioned, his first major book in English is titled Eros and Civilization. It's about sexual liberation. Eros and Civilization is the one I mentioned yesterday where Marcuse says explicitly that we get back into the garden by taking a second bite of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, which he believed was most easily accessible at the time of writing that book through sexual liberation. His argument was that we suppress our sexual libido and our violent libido and channel it into productive work and thus reproduce capitalism where we could instead free it and have sensuous experience. And since I'm saying all the words no one can say from the stage, I think the guy just wanted to have orgies. This, though, was going to require a process of conscientization. But if you thought, by the way, that that groomer's stuff is new, it's not new. It's got at least a 100-year trajectory to get here. The Marxists have been screwing around with the sexualization of children for at least 100 years because they know if they can pull it off that it works. 
The good news is it keeps backfiring on them because everybody's actually legitimately horrified by it. And when you read the queer theorists, you figure out that they'd have no idea why people are horrified by it. And that blind spot is a major weakness for them. But this is going to require you to conscientize. You have to die and be reborn into this new religion. You have to be born again. That's conscientization. How has conscientization evolved through this week of dialectical faith? One day after the other. So you look at woke, by the way, and Marx is just five days ago in dialectical time. Hegel six days ago. We're not that far down the track. How do you do it? Well, if you're Marx, you <laughs> write about it forever and yell about it a lot, and it doesn't work. It has limited success. Turns out not to conscientize. That's what the critical Marxists and the cultural Marxists recognized. Marx couldn't get it done. What did Lenin do? Force it. Force it upon them till it sticks. Accelerate the contradictions. That had some side effects. Bad ones. Mao said, let's force it through culture. Marxism-Leninism with Chinese characteristics. Destroy the four olds. Start society over. That had bad side effects. But that's okay, because the side effects are dialectical. We learn what we didn't realize in our imperfect theoretical idea of the world from the contradictions which manifest in the deaths of tens of millions. Rest in power. None of it was evil. You were just part of the process. History used you and then discarded you. Rest in power. George Floyd. Lukács and Freire come along, especially Lukács in the 20s, and like, this is bullcrap, this isn't working. Why isn't it working? Because conscientization is not something you yell about and tell people they're in a class and they need to spontaneously come together. It's something you have to bring to people. It unfolds in stages. He wrote this long, very difficult, I will not lie, pleasant to read by Marxist standards. It's a very beautifully written book, History and Class Consciousness explaining that consciousness is a process. There are many elements to properly achieving class consciousness, and not least, that actual class consciousness is the last impediment. It's like that you're the absolute who has resolved all the contradictions but has not yet realized you're absolute. Class consciousness is the last impediment that has to be overcome. You have to get through the false consciousness that Marx never really talked about. He mentioned it once or twice. That's so important. That comes from the culture, the way the culture generates the false consciousness, the way the people in power generate conditions where you think this is just how it is. False consciousness. You have to break through that. Paulo Freire picks this up in the 60s, develops it tremendously into a whole system of education to create the consciousness, to overcome false consciousness and fatalism by accepting religion, which is like an opiate that keeps you stuck and accepting your crappy life. And he says everything has to take place in a specific context. So it's going to be contextual to where you are. We're going to hear this again later. But the stages of conscientization, you don't just wake up one day and say, wow, I'm an exploited worker. And then a whole bunch of other people do this at the same time, or maybe you go and you spread the gospel of exploited workerness, and we all awaken to class consciousness, and now we're going to go have a revolution together. That's what Gramsci was mad about when he was writing his ideas down in the first place, is that the Italian Workers' Party wouldn't actually organize. It wouldn't do anything. Yeah, you could convince them they were unhappy, but their attitude was still, what are we going to do about it? And they refused to organize. They weren't conscious enough. So only the first step was being achieved, which is class awareness. The first step of class consciousness, and I'm sorry, I don't have a slide for this. You can watch on the video. I'll try to talk slow so you can run down. Is class awareness. You're aware that you are in a class. You are in, in fact, the workers' class, the oppressed class, person of color, marginalized queer identities. You are in a class. You are identified as part of a class. Your identity is in that class, and what makes you in that class is the knowledge that being in that class makes you suffer. That leads to the second stage of conscientization. You are aware that the class structure dehumanizes. It dehumanizes you because it makes you suffer and steals from you your ability to realize yourself as you truly are. We talked about that at length already. I won't belabor it. But it also dehumanizes the person dehumanizing you. Remember when feminism, feminists used to say that feminism is necessary for men too because patriarchy is bad for men too? 
Why? Because it dehumanizes them. It teaches them to mistreat women, which only somebody who's not fully human would think to do. The oppressor is made into an oppressor by the dynamic itself, even though that person may not realize it. And that dehumanizes them. It takes away their true human nature, which wouldn't oppress if they were fully human. Nobody wants to be an oppressor. Nobody wants to be somebody who dehumanizes. So you have to awaken to this dual nature of dehumanization. That's the second stage, awareness of dehumanization in the class structure. The third is that holistic understanding. That goes all the way back to Hegel. Hegel said you can't understand, you need the dialectic because you can't understand the whole, or sorry, the parts without the whole. You can't understand how history develops unless you understand the whole picture of history, the telos of history, where it's going, why it is, the causes of things that Marx said that he had the only scientific study of. You have to see the whole picture because whoever has the vantage point to see the whole has the power to transform society, which the powerful... The false gods set themselves up in that position and exclude everybody else from it because they benefit from being there and don't want other people to share in the fruits, which is literally that snake story in Genesis again. The false god has access to the trees in the garden, and he doesn't want people to have it because then they would know they're like him. And so when they take a bite, they get partial knowledge. He's like, out. They're going to become like us, out. The same idea, but you have to have a holistic understanding that if you're marginalized, then you were marginalized by somebody. There's a marginalizer and a process of marginalization. Marginalized is a verb. The flip side of that, and you've heard maybe Kimberly Crenshaw say this about critical race theory, and you scratched your head. She says critical race theory is a verb. There's a process of marginalization. So there's a process of escaping marginalization. And that is, say, critical race theory or conscientization. It is a verb. It is a process. The fourth stage, third, in case you're writing it down, is there's a holistic understanding. That's one whole part. You are not marginalized by society unless there is a society that's marginalized you and you are part of that program. That's the holistic understanding. Fourth, you have to realize that you are a conscious subject who can make history. You are a history maker as a conscious subject. That's your true nature as man, a creator who makes history. Nobody makes history, not the animals, there are no gods, but man. And the unfolding of history is the unfolding of man. And if you do that with conscious intent, you reach the desired end point operational success, a desired state of affairs. Those are the words that Mr. Soros used for these same ideas. So fourth is that you're a history maker as a conscious subject. So you have to become class aware, realize that class structure to society dehumanizes you, generate a holistic understanding of the dehumanization process, realize that you are a history maker in this process, but that as the oppressed, you have a special role. Number five, special role as a history maker. You are in the slave position of the master-slave dialectic. You are the one who understands what it is to suffer by the structure of society. Only you have the ability to change history in the right direction. So when you are a truly conscious subject, you're not just a history maker. You're a history maker who knows the right way history should go. They don't. They're maintaining oppression. Maybe for their own benefit, maybe in willful ignorance. Only you know. You're a dual being with dual sight. You're a person and a person who suffers. You are imprisoned in the world of estranged being. Because we're Gnostics now. Then and only then, when you realize that you are the dialectical negation to the state of society as it is, and thus a necessary part of its transformation. Only then do you awaken, says George Lukács, to class consciousness, the full awareness of what it means to be in the working class. The full awareness, if you happen to be one, of what it means to be in the bourgeois class as oppressed or oppressor, but as an agent of history, And to move from the losing position, you can't move society or history alone. You have to do so in solidarity. 
You have to awaken to class solidarity, to act as a whole. As Kimberly Crenshaw says in 1991 in Mapping the Margins, she says, the voices of a few can achieve little compared to the unified voices of millions who participate as a class, and that necessitates identity politics. That's the beginning of the paper, and at the end of the paper, she explains explicitly that means rejecting I am a person who happens to be black and replacing it with I am black. I am my identity first. It is an anchor for my subjectivity and a positive discourse of resistance to the power dynamic that shapes our lives. That's the last class consciousness stage, but even George Lukács in 23 says that's not enough. There's true consciousness beyond that. Otherwise, you're going to have a revolution and reproduce the existing conditions because you still think in terms of classes. So in the last stage, which happens with the revolution, you enter into a true consciousness that's classless, stateless. Class consciousness is the vehicle of socialism in Marx's six stages of history. True consciousness is the awakening of communism. So you have to have a consciousness also that even your class consciousness shall be transcended when the moment arises. Freire developed this tremendously. He put it in a lot of other terms that I'm not going to bother trying to unpack for you. It's actually a bit complicated and technical. Um, but Freire put it in words that you will understand and feel very uncomfortable with. He talked about it in terms. When I said all that death and rebirth stuff before, I wasn't being poetic. I was just paraphrasing Freire. He put it in terms of Easter, and I mean that literally. We've got, you can see some of this. I'm going to read a couple, three paragraphs from the weird chapter in that book. The sine qua non, the true essence, what makes it work, of the, he's talking about educational and theological apprenticeship, demands that, first of all, or sorry, the sine qua non, the apprenticeship demands, is that, so it, you got it. First of all, they really experience their own Easter. That they die as elitists so as to be resurrected on the side of the oppressed. That they be born again with the beings who are not allowed to be. Doesn't that sound exactly like what Dom Helder Camaro was saying when Mike was showing quotes from him? He goes on, such a process implies renunciation of the myths, the mystifications, right? The ideology that are dear to them, the myth of their superiority, the, of the purity of their soul, of their virtues, their wisdom, the myth that they save the poor, the myth of the neutrality of the church. Of, this is an education book. The myth of the neutrality of the church, of theology, of education, science, technology, the myth of their own impartiality. From these grow the other myths of the inferiority of other people, of their spiritual and physical impurity, of the absolute ignorance of the oppressed. We're building a Marxist theory of knowledge. The oppressed are ignorant. That's a myth, he says. They don't have knowledge. Only the elite have knowledge that they reserve to themselves to keep the other people out. This Easter, he goes on, and we've got this one for you. This Easter, which results in the changing of consciousness, in case you thought he just kind of says Easter, <laughs> must be existentially experienced. The real Easter is not commemorative rhetoric. It is praxis. It is historical involvement. The old Easter of rhetoric, that's the one you come to church for on Sunday in April. The old Easter of rhetoric is dead with no hope of resurrection. Where's your God now, Christians? That's what he thinks of you. That's why Antonio Gramsci said, and I quote, socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. The old Easter of rhetoric is dead with no hope of resurrection. It is only in the authenticity of historical praxis that Easter becomes the death that makes life possible. And he goes on, but the bourgeois worldview, basically necrophiliac, death-loving, and therefore static, is unable to accept the supremely biophiliac, life-living experience of Easter. The bourgeois mentality, which is far more than just a convenient abstraction, kills the profound historical dynamism of Easter and turns it into no more than a date on the calendar. In case you thought I was lying about the metaphor part, nope, the Easter you have at the, roughly the same time as the Passover, just a date on the calendar with no hope of resurrection. You have to be reborn, die and be reborn 
as a Marxist to experience a true Easter. And it must be experienced. It must be existentially experienced, he says. The lust to possess, he says, a sign of the necrophiliac worldview. In other words, property rights. The lust to possess. Rejects the deeper meaning of resurrection. Why should I be interested in rebirth if I hold in my hands as objects to be possessed the torn body and soul of the oppressed? So he's now put the oppressed in the image of Christ from the passion. And he goes on, we have this one. I can only experience rebirth at the side of the oppressed by being born again with them in the process of liberation. I cannot turn such a rebirth into a means of owning the world since it is essentially a means of transforming the world. The theology of Marxism is fully actualized by the time these paragraphs were written. They were published in 1985. So his emphasis is on how to make this happen, which is conscientization. That is your Easter process. Their goal is to always make believers. It's to always spread the virus, to fill every institution with it, to change all the consciousnesses, to interject the new sensibility so that we have a new world order able to be accepted, that we've been made suitable to accept it, and that we demand it and want it and can't live without it. That's mixing Freire and Herbert Marcuse. So you have to seize institutions like churches and educational institutions. Those are the two Freire's talking about, but also corporations, also governments, also uh, legal apparatuses, the courts, etc. You have to seize those things in order to use them as instruments to make more people come to consciousness. The point of every institution, everything every institution does, is to raise the consciousness, the class or critical consciousness that we need to have our own personal Easter to become Marxists. The only other thing they do besides raise this consciousness to conscientize is destabilize, disrupt and dismantle, which they then use their destabilization in two ways. They use that destabilization to do the conscientization process. The first way is that things are broken and they have the solution. That's the obvious way of destabilizing. The second is that when you've destabilized somebody, you've made them vulnerable and they're now ready to be inducted into a cult. Their cult induction process is called conscientization, the raising of consciousness. In case you aren't spooked yet on how religious this is when we get to Freire, why are we talking about conscientization at all? Why is he so obsessed with it? Why is it the central concept in all of his education books? And he wrote like a million of them. All of them, by the way, are titled Pedagogy of the Something Except the Politics of Education, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Pedagogy of Hope, Pedagogy of Love, Pedagogy of Diet Coke. It could be literally everything is an opportunity for a lesson to conscientize. That's why. Every single thing is a possible opportunity, a context in which you might be able to conscientize people. But why are we conscientizing? Because that's how you make history or the world. In fact, his exact phrase for his project is that people need to become politically literate in order to, and I quote, speak the word to proclaim the world. That one should sting. He says, learning to read and write ought to be an opportunity for men to know what speaking the word really means. A human act implying reflection and action. There's your Hegel. As such, it is a primordial human right and not the privilege of a few. It's not reserved to the bourgeois people who have the power to speak, the knowledge to speak, the education to speak. Speaking the word is not a true act if it is not at the same time associated with the right of self-expression and world expression, of creating and recreating, of deciding and choosing and ultimately participating in society's historical process. That he's saying that the politically illiterate or the unconscious, the unconscientized, because it's a verb, are estranged from their true nature as makers of the historical process. They are estranged from that. So they cannot know themselves to be knowers. So they cannot know themselves to be speakers of the word. Thus, they cannot know themselves to be the proclaimers of the new world in transformation, in becoming. These are all his words that I'm just saying back to you. This imposes upon them a culture of silence, he says. 
by considering them to be people who aren't valid knowers, who don't know. It's not that they are silent. It is that they have been silenced. It's not that they've been silenced because somebody said you can't speak. It's because they haven't been given the knowledge necessary to speak in a meaningful way. They've been held out from the knowledge of the true nature of their condition, of the true nature of political reality, of social reality, and themselves by the people in power who want to maintain the existing system. This is a Marxist theory of knowing. And once you have a Marxist theory of knowing, it will plug into everything. You want a Marxist theory of medicine? You say that medical knowledge is reserved by a special few who've excluded black people and and other minorities from it, and other knowledges have to be brought in. You want a Marxist mathematics? Mathematicians have predominantly been white, and they've held other indigenous and people of color's perspectives out, and we have to rethink mathematical knowledge. You can create a Marxist theory of anything, which is what woke does, a Marxist theory of knitting, a Marxist theory of your religion, a Marxist theory of math, a Marxist theory of engineering, a Marxist theory of medicine, which will kill millions. It's already on its way. Just by saying that the existing knowledge base is fake and corrupt, held by a special elite few who don't want you in. Now, you're also going to notice for a moment, you're like, wait a minute, something true is happening here. Trust the experts. They're weaponizing the very concept that they're saying that they're denouncing. What a deception that would be. Something a deceiver might do. No kidding. They know what they're doing, and they know what role they're in, in doing it. But for Freire, conscientization gives a voice to people. You can't teach people, he says in his earlier book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, merely that they're oppressed, that they're dependent, and to teach them how to do things to take responsibility for their lives, to climb out of dependency. If you do that, they will sometimes succeed and sometimes they won't, and then they'll be blamed for it. And that's an oppression against the people who fail. But when they succeed, they now have abandoned their class solidarity and have joined the very system that's oppressing the people who didn't make it out. You've heard this logic before. I'm from Appalachia. You've heard it in the mountain. You've heard it in the ghetto. It's the same poisonous idea that leads to you must think of yourself in class solidarity. You must not raise yourself up. You must not be upwardly mobile because you betray the people you leave behind and help recreate the system that keeps them down in the first place. It is Marxist resentment theory. But that's what conscientization is. He says, in the culture of silence, the masses are mute. That is, they are prohibited from creatively taking part in the transformations of their society. That's what I just said. And therefore, they are prohibited from being. There's your ontology. Made a big leap there. You ever notice that the trans people say that if you don't affirm them, that you deny their existence? Didn't that seem weird and histrionic? It's not. It's part of their religion. You're not letting them be what they truly believe they are. You don't want them to be. You're, in fact, possibly committing a genocide. The Marxist deaf community says that if we found a cure for deafness through technology or surgeries or whatever else, that we would be committing a genocide against the deaf because deaf culture would be wiped out from the planet because nobody would be deaf. You're going to laugh. Fat studies calls this a fat genocide if you encourage people to have a healthy weight. You wanting people to attain a healthy weight, generally encourage sound diet and exercise, etc., saying that's associated with their health, would, if widely embraced, commit a fat genocide because it would destroy fat culture. You would wipe that entire genus of culture off the planet. They literally call it a fat genocide. They say that that's what we want when we say you should try to, you know, maybe not eat ice cream. Their very being, they are prohibited from being because they can't speak the word to proclaim the world. Even if they can occasionally read and write because they were taught in humanitarian but not humanist, there's your Marxism, literacy campaigns, they're nevertheless alienated from the power responsible for their silence. Illiterates know they are concrete men. What a weird word that they would use concrete there, right? Like Hegel. 
They know that they do things. They're knowers. What they do not know in the culture of silence in which they are ambiguous dual beings, knowers who are not allowed to know that they're knowers, is that men's actions are, or as such are transforming, creative and recreative. Overcome by the myths of this culture, including the myths of their own natural inferiority, which they are told by the people above them, they do not know that their action upon the world is also transforming. That's when in education they say that we proceed when we try to help under, uh, underperforming groups or populations that we're operating from a deficit model of education. They have some deficit that we have to try to fill in. Ferrari criticizes it as a nutritionist model of education, where if we could just nourish them with the right knowledge, that they would be brought to full health. It's a deficit thinking. That's what he's saying is the wrong way to think, and in fact, it's a form of oppression. That's why our education system operates the way that it does. It's Marxism, though. Prevented from having a structural perception of facts involving them, they do not know that they cannot create, that they cannot have a voice. That is, they cannot exercise the right to participate consciously in the socio-historical transformation of their society because their work does not belong to them. Echoes of Marx are quite clear. So what do we need, he says? An event calling forth the critical reflection of both the learners and the educators. The literacy process must relate speaking the word to transforming reality and to man's role in this transformation. Perceiving the significance of that relationship is indispensable for those learning to read and write if we are really committed to liberation. Such a perception will lead the learners to recognize a much greater right than that of being literate. They will ultimately recognize that as men, they have the right to have a voice. So your kids aren't going to learn to read or write, but they're going to learn to speak up and be activists. That's the higher, more important right. We recognize, he says, the indisputable unity between subjectivity and objectivity in the act of knowing. Hmm, how about that? Reality is never just simply the objective datum, the concrete fact, but is also men's perception of it. That's subject-object dualism, all the way back to Marx, that defines what it means to be a man. The point for Freire is explicit. I'm not kidding, he says it. It is to transform the world into a utopia which can only be achieved, he says, by the dialectical leftists. He doesn't call them dialectical leftists, but he does say by the left. It's done through a process of repeated denunciations, chopping down the tree, and eventually the tree of life is there. He says the right makes no denunciation or proclamation except, as we have said, to denounce whoever denounces it and to proclaim its own myths. And you're like, wow, that iron law woke projection's real. A true revolutionary project, on the other hand, to which the utopian dimension is natural, is a process in which the people assume the role of subject in the precarious adventure of transforming and recreating the world, which he just said is the whole point. The right is necessarily opposed to such a project and attempts to immobilize it. Only for Freire, the dialectical left can do it. Only the conscientized can do it. Conscientization implies further the critical insertion of the conscientized person into a demythologized reality. How Marxist can you get? This is why conscientization is an unrealizable project for the right. The right is by its nature incapable of being utopian because it's not cracked. And hence, it cannot develop a form of cultural action that would bring about conscientization. There can be no conscientization of the people without a radical denunciation of dehumanizing structures. What did I just say about the process? Accompanied by the proclamation of a new reality to be created by men. Not the creation or the building of a new reality, the proclamation of a new reality to be created by men. Conscientization, in other words, is the process by which you turn a normal person into a Gnostic. So what about this utopia he mentioned? So utopia has a weird meaning. I don't know if you know the history of the concept. It arose in a satire written by the theologian Thomas More at the very beginning of the 1500s. He described a perfect society that operates how it operates, and named this perfect society Utopia, which from the Greek means no place, nowhere, 
meaning it doesn't exist. In fact, it can't exist. If I was going to, as an outsider, tell you one of the chief and most powerful and most important things that Christianity teaches beyond redemption is that perfection lies outside this world. You aren't going to make it. Don't try. It is a bad idea, and it will cause ruin. And that theme is repeated over and over throughout the Bible. Do not try to build the utopia. It's in heaven, outside this world, in the transcendent realm where God rules. Very important distinction. The Marxists have obliterated it. For these people, what utopian means is someone who believes a potential perfected, liberated future is possible, but cannot be described in advance. Because if you describe it in advance, you set the target you're going to shoot for, and if you ever achieve it, it immediately becomes a right-wing tyranny, because it has to move left again. For the critical theorists, who are really the first ones to bring up within Marxism a huge discussion of the utopia, utopian thinking, there's a bit of a split. Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno, we already mentioned what Horkheimer said, we can't describe the ideal society in the terms of the existing society, so I invented the critical theory because we can criticize the aspects of this society that we wish to change. There's your hermetic break open the mundane to release the divine concept. Theodore Adorno who is another arch-critical Marxist. He wrote the book Dialectic of Enlightenment with Max Horkheimer, which is the book of critical theory, said in the 1960s, it is impossible to cast an image of the utopia in the positive. All we can do is criticize in the negative that which we don't like. Herbert Marcuse, on the other hand, who led the change into identity Marxism and is the architect of the world that we live in largely today, in theory, he is the theoretician behind it, was a bit more optimistic about utopia. In his essay on liberation from 1969, he writes, I believe that this restrictive, restrictive conception, meaning the prevailing critical Marxist view that I just shared with you of utopian possibility, must be revised. And that the revision is suggested and even necessitated by the actual evolution of contemporary societies. The dynamic of their productivity deprives utopia of its traditional unreal content. Now I've got this for you. What is denounced as utopian is no longer that which has no place and cannot have any place in the historical universe, but rather that which is blocked from coming about by the power of the established societies. It's not that you can't be in the garden, it's that the established power in the demon of God kicked you out because he didn't want you as an equal. It's the Gnostic lie in Genesis that you were warned about on the second page of the Bible. He goes on, and I have this for you too in the essay on liberation. He says, utopian possibilities are inherent in the technical and technological forces of advanced capitalism and socialism. The rational utilization of these forces on a global scale would terminate poverty and scarcity within a very foreseeable future. It would also overcome the sustainability problem, like I mentioned in the panel yesterday, and we'll come back to later. It's a very ominous quote. For Freire, this takes place, as you heard, through this chopping down endless process of denunciation. But he says denunciation has its opposite, of course, which is enunciation. And contained within, alchemically contained within, denunciation is enunciation. You denounce the existing world and announce a new one in the same act of negative criticism. That's the magic. That's literally alchemy. And the only people who can do it are the conscious, the Gnostics, because they have a glimpse of the absolute state, even if they can't describe it. They know which aspects of the existing society are in contradiction to it and can criticize those, and that will allow the utopian possibility of the future to emerge from its existence in the present. And that's why conscientization matters. You have to be a Gnostic to engage in the alchemy correctly. You have to be a wizard before you can perform alchemy. Harry? 
He says, I've got this one for you too. There is no enunciation without denunciation. You can't say the new world unless you denounce the existing world. There is no enunciation without denunciation. Just as every denunciation generates enunciation. Every time you denounce something from a position of consciousness, you announce a new utopian possibility, he says. Without the latter, hope is impossible. In an authentic utopian vision, however, and now we're going to echo Hebrews 11. In an authentic utopian vision, however, hoping does not mean folding one's arms and waiting. Waiting is only possible when one filled with hope seeks through reflective action to achieve that announced future which is being born within the denunciation. Faith is the hope of what's looked for. That's the point of all of this. That's the point of what Mike was saying with putting the the theological leg under this. You have to conscientize the people. That happens in education, it happens in churches, and it can happen in any other context that you can turn into a lesson to bring about the conscientization. The point of the conscientization is to make a Gnostic who has the magical power to denounce the existing world correctly, to say which things are right and wrong in the right way so that a better utopian future becomes possible in the next step. And that, we already saw, has to be a perpetual, repeated event over and over and over again, lest it immediately become sclerotic, bureaucratic, conservative, stabilizing, right-wing, counter-revolutionary, whatever you want. Those are all words I've pulled from their literature, not my words, to describe that phenomenon. And the goal is not to get to day seven of the dialectical week and rest. The goal is to continue the dialectical process because communists never rest. So what's tomorrow in the next dialectical week? What's day eight? What is theoretical and dialectical tomorrow? Well, you already know the answer where we're going, but we're going to go back to the Hegelian Trinity diagram, if you don't mind. I want to give you a kind of an understanding. I've said this a couple of times, but you see the idea goes to the state, goes to the spirit, or in other words, idea goes to material, goes to cultural, goes to theoretical, goes to cultural, or sorry, goes to material, goes to cultural. So it's, you know, idea, material, culture, idea, material, culture, round and round and round, lifts up every stage, slides left every stage. Hegel is the idea, Marx is the material, cultural and critical Marxists and identity Marxists are cultural. Postmodern and woke have gone on to the realm of knowledge, which is a new kind of ideal, a higher level ideal that takes into effect cultural aspects, the marginalized knowledges of other cultures. It takes into into account material effects, bringing in the material conditions caused by past injustices like slavery, apartheid, Jim Crow, segregation, the internment of Japanese during World War II, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Michel Foucault's history of sexuality about the entire long trajectory of history of how homosexuals were oppressed in various ways and how in essence that's not only not got better, it's just got worse by changing forms. We've gone back into ideal plus. So the next turn of this wheel is going to go to material plus, and the turn after that will go back to cultural plus. So day eight is going to be a material day. Sustainability. The tyranny of the 21st century. It is a material Marxism on a higher level that incorporates cultural issues, that incorporates ideal issues like knowledge. Day nine will be some kind of global consciousness, a cultural revolution for a global citizenship consciousness. Global citizenry, global currency, one world government, etc. Not creating those things necessarily, but causing people to have the consciousness that that's the way that it needs to be, and criticizing something like the idea that a nation could exist or be sovereign because that withholds that idea from people. That's a bourgeois, outdated idea. It doesn't move left. Marxism was always meant to be global communism. We always have to move toward that. So that will be the next two days. Sustainability and global consciousness. They go hand in hand, obviously. So now, day eight, sustainability. 
the tyranny of the 21st century. Mike obviously scared the daylights out of you, so you knew this was coming. We talked about it yesterday, so you knew it was coming. I'd like to present to you uh, an image, if we can, from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals website. 17 goals to transform our world. Well, son of a bee, would you look at that? Now, I want you to look at that little colorful wheel down there in the corner, not for any particular reason in itself. I want you to learn to recognize the eye of Sauron. <laughs> you are going to see that wheel all over the place once you realize it. And the thing that should go in the center of the wheel is a hammer and sickle. You will find that on the lapels of the people at Davos. You will find it plastered on educational documents outlining the programs that your school is going to do on its next five-year program. Don't worry, we'll get it in four. Two plus two equals five. Four plus the enthusiasm of the workers. Literal Soviet poster. 17 goals to transform our world. And obviously, Klaus Schwab is in bed with all of this, as we already heard. The World Economic Forum, through his program of ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance, tools. So what does Klaus Schwab say? I've got you a quote. Policies must be sustainable because there is no other possible path conducive to social, economic, and environmental welfare. In short, sustainability is the only feasible way forward. So there's an interesting image of Klaus where he gave an interview, presumably in his library or his home or something. If we could pull up that picture of Klaus talking. Um, so you see, there's Klaus. He's looking great, got some nice action going on. Do you see what's there over his right shoulder? You see a little bust of somebody? That's Lenin. Isn't that weird? Do any of you have a bust of Lenin in your house? Would you, if you did, leave it on the shelf accidentally like we sometimes see women do in inappropriate ways on the news, on the Zoom culture we have now, accidentally, in a major interview where people think you're a weirdo globalist, unless you meant it? Of course, we see a bust of Lenin over Klaus's shoulder. What Klaus tells us, in fact, though, we've heard this word a lot, the Wissenschaft, right? That's he's German, the Wissenschaft. This, it's der Wissenschaft. Maybe it's die Wissenschaft. My German sucks. The science is incontrovertible, Klaus Schwab tells us right after that. If the science is incontrovertible, so is, in a way, common sense. It's hard to comprehend how the move toward environmental sustainability could take place without a concomitant move towards social sustainability. But he says the problem is actually economics. This is from his book, The Great Narrative, which came out this year. He says, actually, probably not in the exact same words, he probably says it in all of his books because I've noticed they all say the same thing. He says the problem is economics. The economic incentives are wrong. Economics cares about the wrong things. It doesn't value the human enough. It doesn't value nature enough. We have to rethink how we organize business out of its profit-driven shareholder model. He says... But the economist does not know himself what cause he serves. He does not know that with all his egotistical reasoning, he, is nevertheless, he nevertheless forms but a link in the chain of mankind's universal progress. He does not know that by his disillusion of all sectional interests, he, is, he merely paves the way for the great transformation to which this century is moving, the reconciliation of mankind with nature and with itself. Except... Klaus didn't say that. That's Karl Marx in the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts in 1844. 140-some-odd years earlier. Under, no, more than that. Sorry, I've got my dates messed up. I was going to my 60s. Long time back. I'm not doing the math in my head on, on a stage. I promise I'm a mathematician. I proved it by not being able to do arithmetic. <laughs> do you need a proof that there are an infinite number of primes? We can do that. What Klaus actually said was not what Karl Marx just said, which I read to you. He said, sustainability is normally defined as the ability to meet our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. It amounts to asking ourselves what we should leave to the next generation to ensure that they have opportunities at least as good as those of the previous generation. Sounds nice so far. 
What assets do we want to pass on to them? Physical capital, infrastructure, buildings, machinery comes naturally to mind, as does natural capital, our ecosystems, water, air, land, forests, biodiversity, and oceans. Human capital, health and education. And social capital, public trust. He's doing a great job with that, didn't he? Strong institutions and social cohesion. That's another one he's really just nailing. All four forms of capital are essential, but the viable development of future generations depends critically on the quality of natural, human, and social capital, which too often tends to be regarded not equally important or relevant. Now let me pause before I read the punchline here. Natural, human, social. Marx's dialectical wheel. Man, nature embodied in the state, society. Depends critically on the quality of natural, human, and social capital, which too often tend to be regarded as not equally important or relevant. Herein lies the vital necessity of sustainability. Environmental sustainability preserves the natural capital, while social sustainability maintains the quality of human and social capital. The great transformation to which the century is moving, the reconciliation of mankind with nature and with itself. That was Marx and that was Schwab, writing 100 and, I'm doing the math, 80 years apart. 78, yeah. He doesn't just echo Marx in a way where it's like a gotcha. There are uncanny parallels between Klaus Schwab's writing and Herbert Marcuse's writings in things like the essay on liberation in 1969 and One Dimensional Man in 1964. In particular, the idea that advanced shareholder capitalism is itself unsustainable. Marcuse talks about that at length. I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of his quotes in that regard, but he does. It's one of his major themes. It's not a sustainable process. More plastic, more gadgets, more planned obsolescence, less human enjoyment, less art, less reality. We have to give up our gadgets, be content with less, he says. Marcuse, has, we saw before, how do we get there? Through an imaginative use of technology. Technological progress is going to liberate us when we apply our socialist imagination to it, which has to be liberated through consciousness. We have to generate a new sensibility in man. The radical transformation of society, he tells us, implies the union of a new sensibility with a new rationality. The imagination becomes productive if it becomes the mediator between sensibility on the one hand and theoretical as well as practical reason on the other. How about that? Theoretical idea, practical idea on the other. And in this harmony of faculties in which Kant saw the token of freedom, father of the dialectic, guides the reconstruction of society. That's Herbert Marcuse. He says the real interest, same Herbert Marcuse, the attainment of conditions in which man could shape his own life was that of no longer subordinating his life to the requirement of profitable production, shareholder capitalism, to an apparatus controlled by forces beyond his control, profit, the market. And the attainment of such conditions meant the abolition of capitalism. It is not simply the higher standard of living, the illusory bridging of the consumer gap between the rulers and the ruled, which has obscured the distinction between the real and the immediate interest of the ruled. Marxian theory soon recognized that impoverishment does not necessarily provide the soil for revolution, that a highly developed consciousness and imagination may generate a vital need for radical change in advanced material conditions. The power of corporate capitalism has stifled the emergence of such a consciousness and such an imagination. And Klaus says the ultimate role, after he says that it is our imagination and our technology that will set us free, by the way, it is the ultimate role of business in a society remains to do business, but global corporate citizenship, day nine, is an extension of the stakeholder concept. See, it's an extension of the material stakeholder part, day eight. It involves the corporation acting as a stakeholder in global society in conjunction with government and civil society. And it's a notion that can be considered as a long-term investment. Since companies depend on natural and social ecosystems in which they operate, surely it is in their ultimate interest to look to the well-being of the same ecosystem when it is beset by so many problems, which limit the ability to unleash the imagination and to apply technology that he's going to bring in to solve the problem. It's a huge parallel between them. How turns out to also have a parallel. How? 
How is this to be achieved? Marcuse said we need a radicalized youth movement that is willing to reject the old order. It has to be conscientized, but it has to be willing to reject the old order. He called it the great refusal, not the great reset. The great refusal of the existing order. Maybe you have a great reset after you have a great refusal. I don't know. You have to refuse the existing social order. You have to re re refuse the existing social contract. And the young people are going to be the ones to do it. So in the great narrative, Klaus says, among the many societal challenges we collectively face, the most damaging and deep-rooted is inequality. As UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez put it, inequality defines our time. That sounds like a little bit of BS. Its manifestations are so multifaceted and have reached such proportions to address that it, that it demands nothing short of a redefinition of our social contract. Rising concerns about inequality and the profound sentiment of dissatisfaction, if not anger that it provokes, will prompt many, he's talking about our conditions, the calamities, the COVID, will prompt many societies around the world to redefine the terms of their social contract. Broadly defined, the social contract refers to the often implicit set of arrangements and expectations that govern the relations between individuals and institutions. But simply, it is the glue that binds us, our societies, together. Without it, the social fabric unravels. The growing, like by disrupt and dismantle maybe, the growing general recognition is that the social contract in many countries around the world is broken. And that, it is, that its multiple elements from cradle to grave need to change. That's Klaus Schwab. Not Herbert Marcuse, believe it or not. He goes on, for, for decades, pretty much everywhere, the social contract has slowly and almost imperceptibly evolved in a direction that has forced individuals to assume greater responsibility for their individual lives and economic outcomes. That's the individual responsibility model that Ferreri said betrays people. Leading large swaths of the population, most evidently in the low income brackets, to conclude that the social contract was at best being eroded, if not in some cases breaking down entirely. Oh, well, there's that Marxist resentment that is the conscientization. Today, the fundamental reasons underpinning the loss of faith in our social contracts, he's denouncing the social contract and announcing a new one, right? He's denouncing and denouncing. Like for Aerie, which he got from Kamara, which he got from Kamara. Today, the fundamental reasons underpinning the loss of faith in our social contract coalesce around issues of inequality, the ineffectiveness of most redistribution policies, a sense of exclusion and marginalization, and a general sentiment of unfairness. It is for this reason that many citizens have begun to denounce a breakdown of the social contract, expressing more and more forcefully a general loss of trust in institutions and leaders. In some countries, the immune system is about to get mentioned, guys. It's not their fault, you see. There's a scapegoat. Somebody else did it. We must move left further. In some countries, this widespread exasperation has taken the form of both peaceful and violent demonstrations. In others, it has led to electoral victories for populist and extremist parties. Make America great again. Whichever form it takes, in almost all cases, the establishment's response has been left wanting, ill-prepared for the rebellion and out of ideas, and policy levers to address the problems. So what particular forms might the new social contract take? There are no off-the-shelf ready-to-use models because each potential solution depends on the history and culture of the context to which it applies. Huh, the context. Where you have to conscientize in terms of the context that you find yourself in. For obvious reasons, a good social contract for China will be different from one for the US. Wow, they get different rules, how about that? which in turn will not resemble one for Denmark or Nigeria. However, they could all share some common features and principles. Maybe people could, I don't know, willingly give up some of their freedom to achieve the greater good and more freedom. What do those look like? The absolute necessity for which has been made ever more obvious by the social and economic consequences of the pandemic crisis. Two stand out. One, a broader, if not universal, provision of social assistance, social insurance, health care, and basic quality services. The socialism. <laughs> and two, a move toward enhanced protection for workers in the form of mandatory benefits, a minimum decent wage, and help to adapt to the disruptive effects of innovation. But how is this going to happen? 
First, he tells us that there's going to be a public-private partnership. The governments and the corporations will come together. He says, normally, we don't accept that logic, but we're entering into a new time. And he goes on to say, collectively redefining the terms of our social contracts is an epical task that binds the substantial challenges of the present moment to the hopes of the future. As Henry Kissinger reminded us, the historic challenge for leaders is to manage the crisis while building the future. Failure could set the world on fire. It's kind of like what an arsonist might think. While reflecting on the contours, we think a future social contract might follow. We ignored our peril, the opinion of the younger generation who will be asked to live with it. The youth rebellion's coming. Their adherence is divisive, or decisive, sorry. Their adherence is decisive, and thus, to better understand what they want, we must not forget to listen. This is all the more significant because the younger generation is likely to be more radical in its demands in refashioning our social contract. The pandemic has upended their lives, and a whole generation across the globe will be defined by economic insecurity and climate anxiety. Yeah, thanks, guys. They will bear these scars forever. Those are your kids, by the way. History uses them and then discards them, don't worry. They're doing their part. Already the millennials, at least in the Western world, are worse off than their parents in terms of earnings, assets, and wealth. They're less likely to own a home or have children than their parents were. Now another generation, Gen Z, is entering a system that it sees as failing and that will be beset by long-standing problems revealed and exacerbated by the pandemic. As a college junior put it, authoritative sources only in Klaus Schwab's books, Young people have a deep desire for radical change because we see the broken path ahead. Klaus is proposing a two-pronged vanguard model, Lenin and Mao, where we heard of Marxism-Leninism in the past, Klaus is providing Leninism-Maoism. Corporations and government in a public-private partnership are going to provide a top-down Leninist-style vanguard through ESG to force the change. On the other hand, we're going to create a Maoist revolution, mostly using social-emotional learning, which he promotes relentlessly in our schools, to radicalize the students to have the consciousness and beliefs that he just articulated, to create a bottom-up movement. This will stimulate a cultural revolution alongside with Mao, Mao's vision that will tear things apart inside out. There are two vanguards, though. A youth rebellion that they're inculcating through social-emotional learning, and a top-down forcing through environmental social governance components that are linked through that S component of the ESG, the social. But really, he does mean a vanguard. How will this generation respond? By proposing radical solutions and often radical action. Hmm. To prevent issues like social inequalities from worsening or the next disaster like climate change from striking. The young generation see both as two facets of the same coin, intergenerational inequality. Little resentment there. It will most likely demand a radical alternative to the present course because its members are frustrated and dogged by a nagging belief that the current system has failed them and is fractured beyond repair. Disrupt and dismantle so we can build back better. As a result, Youth activism is increasing worldwide, being revolutionized by social media that fosters mobilization to an extent that would have been impossible before. Imagine if they were using big tech to like make people really mad and agitated and enjoying social movements with social media. And then, like, imagine if you were doing that and you felt this need to brag about it in your book. It takes many different forms, ranging from non-institutionalized political participation to demonstrations and protests. He doesn't mention riots and addresses inequalities in a multifaceted manner. Seeing issues as diverse as income inequalities, climate change, economic reforms, gender equality, LGBTQ rights, as part of a more general inequality problem. That's woke. The young generation, he says, is firmly at the vanguard of social change. There is little doubt that it will be the catalyst for change. He actually says, that the corporations and the governments and the NGOs will force ESG upon us in this book. He says that. And so good luck trying to resist it. Good luck faking it. He says, don't wokewash it. Don't greenwash. You're going to have to do it for real. He actually says that. 
But he says, if you try to get away with it, don't worry. The activists from the youth will demand it. They're your future, emplo- they're your future employees, your future customers. They will demand that you change. We're going to press you from the top. We're going to make it demanded from below. And we're going to change the culture throughout so that it sticks by interjecting a new sensibility into especially the youth who will then go on to demand it. As my friend uh, in Oklahoma, John Owsley, says, um, they don't need your guns if they have your children. All they have to do is wait a little bit. So what was Marx's goal again? It was to transcend private property. That's true communism. It's the full spiritual transcendence of private property where man realizes who he is. So he can live fully as man in nature that has been made suitable for mankind. We saw that in Mike's presentation as well. Don Don Helder Kamara said we needed to make the world suitable for man and for God. Karl Marx says, Communism, as the positive transcendence of private property, as human self-estrangement, and therefore as the real appropriation of the human essence by and for man, communism, therefore, is the complete return of man to himself as a social, that is, human being, a return accomplished consciously in embracing the entire wealth of previous development. This communism, as fully developed naturalism, equals humanism. And as a fully developed humanism equals naturalism. It is the genuine resolution of the conflict between man and nature and between man and man. The true resolution of the strife between existence and essence. Between objectification and self-confirmation. Between freedom and necessity. Between the individual and the species. Communism is the riddle of history solved and it knows itself to be the solution. Klaus Schwab's organization, the World Economic Forum, has one sentence that is the most famous among its sentences. And you've probably seen this image. Put the cute brown-headed guy up. You will own nothing, and you will be happy. We'll sustain the human. We'll sustain the environment. You will own nothing, and you will be happy. Communism as the positive transcendence of private property, as human self-estrangement, and therefore as the real appropriation of the human essence by and for man. Communism, therefore, as the complete return of man to himself as a social, that is, human being. Communism is the riddle of history solved, and it knows itself to be the solution. This is the next stage of the dialectical faith of leftism. This is a global communist maneuver that we are living through. Its main tools are ESG and to radicalize the youth, social emotional learning in our schools. It's creating a two-headed vanguard operation that takes the best from Lenin and the best from Mao. A bit of a cultural revolution which has been going on pretty vigorously now, and that's what we're experiencing a couple of years of now. A bit of a youth rebellion to destroy the four olds and demand a new society from the bottom up, and a bit of a top-down force through the corporations in public-private partnership with the governments and the NGOs. The dialectical faith of leftism that this conference was dedicated to, the theology of Marxism that this conference was dedicated to, is that being is estranged from itself. But we can gain knowledge through suffering in our estrangement to use the dialectic itself to transform man, society, and the world to end our self-estrangement. And if we just come together, it'll work this time. Thank you guys for coming.